So we'll, we'll keep, uh, keep going. Well, again, good evening and welcome to the first of three town hall meetings uh, that we have uh, welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Fagan, uh, superintendent of Humble Independent School District. My name is Trey Kramer. I'm the assistant superintendent over high schools and I am serving as you can say moderator and my really nothing more than me welcoming you and, and kind of laying out some uh, some uh, protocols on how we want to have a very effective uh, a comfortable uh, exciting meeting tonight and so I, I do want to uh, make a note of a few things on how we're going to try to handle uh, uh, the town hall uh, the questions for for the meeting um, there are two microphones that are stationed right here in the middle one basically here on the, the right, left-hand side of the auditorium, your right, and, and then the right, your left. Uh, we're asking that if you have a question that you would just step up to the microphone, ask the question, uh, and then uh, take a seat, and then the question will be answered. There'll be some further dialogue that'll be provided on that uh, here shortly. There also is an opportunity for those of you that do not feel like asking the question, uh, you'll have an opportunity to write the question down. Uh, throughout the course of the, uh, the town hall meeting, uh, I will be uh, given cards uh, that we will, um, you know, I will stand up and read those cards on behalf of whoever wrote the card. And so you have an opportunity, if you're not comfortable standing up and speaking, you'll have an opportunity to write your, uh, write your question down and it'll be read at that point in time. Also, if we need a Spanish translation, if there's anybody in the auditorium that would prefer to have Spanish translation, we have a, a translator right over here to my right, your left. You can come sit in this area over here, and uh, we'll be more than happy to assist in the translation uh, of anything that's being uh, said tonight. I think ultimately, uh, for us, we're excited to have uh, Dr. Fagan on board uh, we're looking forward to uh, the, the first of these again tonight. We've allocated two hours, six to eight. Uh, you know, if we, get, if we need all two hours, that's wonderful. Uh, but again, at, at about 7.50, uh, we'll, we'll kind of summarize where we're at, uh, try to take the last question at that point in time, and make sure that we, we stay on schedule uh, for uh, the, the 8 o'clock um, ending of the town hall meeting. At the end of uh, uh, the presentation, you'll see some slides. We do have two additional town hall meetings that are scheduled uh, for this Thursday, one at uh, Humble High School and then on the 28th at Atascita High School. Uh, so without further ado, I think uh, also, let me, Jamie and, uh, and Robin, if you have questions, you see those ladies, they can, if you turn those into her, they'll get those to me. So they're, they're stationed there. And again, the microphones are, are in the back. We want to make this as relaxing and as comfortable as possible. And really, it's just kind of like a family meeting. And, uh, you know, we just want to have a little bit of structure to it so we can make sure that Dr. Fagan gets an opportunity to respond to each and all questions. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Keith Lopez. He is the Humble Independent School District Board President. Keith, come up, please. Um, I'll be brief. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight. I'm, I'm really pleased the, the size of the turnout, and I'm really excited to introduce uh, the first new superintendent we've had in 15 years in our district. Um, this is an opportunity for everybody in this room to get to know Dr. Fagan, and, 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 and how you really get to know someone is to ask questions and have those questions answered. And so I encourage each and every person here that has a question to either get up to the mic or to write the question down and answer it. Um, and this includes, so to have it answered, and this includes the hard questions, this includes the uncomfortable questions, and this includes also, if you want to ask a softball, that's great too. But again, I appreciate it, and without further, further ado, Dr. Fagan. that we're doing this correctly so I, I'm gonna have our Spanish translator make an announcement in Spanish to make sure that if there's anybody needs the translation that we're good to go <laughs> it's all about protocol people okay all right buenas tardes y bienvenidos a uh, esta uh, ceremonia donde vamos a conocer a Dr. Feigen eh, si alguno de ustedes necesitan una traducción en español estoy a sus órdenes eh, ustedes pueden pasar a sentarse de este lado donde voy a proveerles la traducción Muchísimas gracias. Okay. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. I'm sure you have a million things going on. I know what that's like. Um, I'm going to give you, I would like to start out, if it's okay with you, with sort of the speed dating version of getting to know Liz. And then I'm happy to answer any questions that you have at all. But um, so I, 
I want to start clear back a little ways just because I think it's pertinent to the context of who I am. So my mother was a high school English teacher, ultimately became a middle school English teacher, my middle school English teacher. Yes, all of you who had that experience, I know you were the ones that went aw. Um, and so, um, so education was very prominent at my house uh, for as long as I can remember. And when I was in sixth grade, my mother remarried, and my stepfather was, get this, my high school social studies teacher. <laughs> and so again, you know, education was prominently placed uh, at my dinner table every evening. And when you're 18 years old or 17 years old, you know, you're pretty sure that you're not really sure what you're going to become, but you're pretty sure it's not going to be your parents at that point. In my defense, you know, the brain is not fully developed till you're 24, so, you know, that's how it is. And so, um, I really didn't want to go into education at all. I wanted to go into pre-medicine. I loved science. I always had. I knew that was part of my heart. And so I started down that pathway. Now, not long after that, I realized that the sight of someone's skull makes me feel, feel ill and faint, so it's probably all for the best that it didn't go that way. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm in, I'm in uh, doing my undergrad, and I'm doing science. I'm not sure where it's going, thinking pre-med. And I'm a Pizza Hut waitress, and I think I made about $1.75 an hour plus tips. And so one of my professors uh, was asked to become an interim dean for the university because the dean left suddenly. And so he came to me and he said, hey, Liz, you've taken all these science classes. Would you mind teaching the lab for me for my biology for elementary teachers class? And I was kind of hesitant because I was busy. And then he said, I'll pay you. And I said, great. And um, I was in. And so I actually started teaching this lab, and I have to tell you that uh, it was a, a moment that changed everything because uh, from the very first day of teaching that, that course, I would have done it for free. He wouldn't have had to pay me a dollar because I loved it so much. And I um, immediately switched to uh, science education to become a high school science teacher. And so that's what I did. I became a high school science teacher. I taught chemistry, advanced biology, biology. Uh, my first year, I believe I taught some physical science. First year teachers understand that. Um, and so at the end of the day, uh, I, I love that work. My principal, Rick Hilbert, came to me and he said, you know, sometimes Roger Campbell, my assistant, has to be gone. And, you know, I think you'd be a really great uh, principal someday. So how about if you sub for Roger when he's gone? And I thought, OK. I mean, I would like to try it out. So that makes sense to me. And so I did. I subbed in the office when Roger was gone. And ultimately, I realized that I really enjoyed that work. And I thought that I could make a difference for great teachers if I became a principal. I thought that maybe I could remove some bureaucracy and some silly stuff. and really make a difference, and so that's the path that I went down. I, I became a high school principal. And the story of Rick Hilbert is sort of instructive to the way that my whole life was. It's just, I was just blessed, I was fortunate. Every time I would be in a position, someone would see something in me and, and give me an opportunity to do something harder or different. And um, in each situation, I was able to move down this path that sort of just revealed itself as I went. It wasn't a plan. People say, well, when you were, you know, however old were you planning to be a superintendent? And I actually wasn't. I just sort of followed the path that, that you know, kind of came before me and um, went on to be the executive director of high schools in the Des Moines Independent School District in Des Moines, Iowa. Worked for a phenomenal superintendent there. Uh, ultimately became the associate superintendent in Des Moines. And then both of my parents separately retired to Arizona. And I had had my daughter, Meredith, uh, who is currently 11 today. Today is her birthday. And, um, and so uh, more about her later. And so I'd had my daughter, Meredith, and, um, and I thought, you know, it'd be really great to be near my family. So I think that we should look for positions. I should look for a position in, um, in Arizona. And my husband was supportive. And so I went to be the superintendent for the Tucson Unified School District. And I really enjoyed the work there. It was very rigorous. It was a very challenging school district um, under a federal desegregation order. A lot of things that were uh, quite challenging. And one of the biggest challenges in Arizona that I learned quickly was that the funding for education was much lower than it needed to be. And that's just the facts. So imagine the, a per pupil revenue of $3,100 because that was mine my last year in Arizona. And it's nearly impossible to put together a very high quality education program for every single child, uh, regardless of their uniquenesses, on $3,100. So the opportunity in Douglas County came about. My daughter Meredith was going to be entering kindergarten that year. 
and um, I accepted that opportunity where I have been for six years. And now I have daughter Olivia also, um, because I like things to be challenging, I guess. I interviewed on Tuesday, Monday in Douglas County, drove home on Tuesday, had Olivia on Friday. And, um, and so that was the way that goes. And Meredith had one request, she's my older daughter, she had one request. She said, you know, I'm, I'm good with this move. I think it's really a great thing for our family. We talked about that, more on that in a minute too. Um, but she said, I have one request, and that is I'd like to swim at state with my swim team before, before I leave. And so that's why she's not here yet, but she will be next week when she's coming back and her sister with me. And then her, their dad has to drive the dog down. So that's one of those things. So um, anyway, so in Douglas County, um, you know, I was committed to the work we were doing to develop a curriculum and think about assessment differently, um, high quality assessments that measure the most important things, not the most easy things to measure, and doing what's best for students and still being accountable to fa uh, families and the community, all of that. We started down a very rigorous path, some things that were embraced um, by, by the whole community and some things that frankly just weren't and uh, that the board was very committed to doing. And, and that's certainly within a board's policy decision making right. Uh, to move forward with things that they believe are in the best interest of the school district. And so, to that end, um, I felt like I really needed to stay in Douglas County and see through the work we were doing instructionally in the classroom, supporting great teachers, supporting great leaders, and really doing good things for kids. And after six years, I felt very comfortable that the capacity had been built, the work was in place, that people would continue on and doing what's best for students with or without um, my leadership in place there. And that's what I believe is the mark of a great leader, is somebody who builds capacity in others uh, in alignment with the overall or the majority overall view of the community. And then when that leader leaves, that work can continue because it's not dependent on, on the, the person, which is what I felt like was the case there. So my husband and I, being, he's an engineer, although he's a stay-at-home dad right now, um, and I'm a former science teacher, so we're a little science nerdish. And so the two of us sat down and really kind of got out a map of the country, and we started crossing off states, right? So you start globally, and then you get down to this local piece. So we went through and we started crossing off states that we didn't feel were best for our family, that we didn't feel would be the right fit uh, for our children, the schools, the community, me professionally, or, and, and our family values, frankly. And so ultimately we got down to one state, uh, the state of Texas, the great state of Texas, I should say. And, um, and, and then we started exploring more closely the, the pieces and parts of Texas and really understanding. And I know this sounds crazy, but it's the truth. Um, I had friends who were coming to Texas on spring break and they actually said, hey, do you want us to visit some areas and stuff? And so they did. Um, and, and they actually shared with us uh, data. They went to playgrounds, they went to grocery stores, they did a lot of things to tell us um, what kind of place. They even visited two of your schools. Um, and so ultimately they gave us all this information and uh, we decided that there was one school district, one community that was our very first choice. It's the place that we wanted to come and put down roots, raise our children, uh, contribute to the community, professionally be part of education, have a wonderful place for our daughters to go to school and be little kids and grow up in a place that values the whole child. And so we selected the Humble Independent School District. And I applied. And what an honor, although I have to tell you this, the board put me through the ringer on the process, which is not bad, but I've been through several processes, none like that. Pretty sure that they were gonna keep people as long as it took to make them fall apart so that they would know if they were good. There was gonna be no show. Um, and I, I respect that. So um, my husband was here for the process. We spent an entire day, another half of a day, another morning um, doing a lot of different things. And so at the end of all of that, we had just really put our heart and souls into deciding what was the right place for the Fagan family. And this was it, and we were so hopeful, and now we are so honored and so excited to be part of the Umbel ISD community. The school district, the folks that are here have been really tremendous uh, in the last few weeks. I know I've been here a whole two weeks, but two weeks and one day almost, um, two days. And so um, I do feel though that all of our research, all of our hard work, was right on the money, that we were right, that this is the best school district, and it's going to continue to be the best school district, 
and it's going to continue to care about whole children and individual and unique children because it does today and it will tomorrow. And I can just tell from talking with staff members and students and others that everybody is committed to that idea that children are unique and learning is personal and that that has continued on this district for a long time and it will continue on uh, going forward. So that is the speed dating version of my life and this experience and I am happy to answer any questions that you have for me. Um, I really do appreciate this opportunity because there's one last thing I want you to know and that is that I believe that every district is unique, which is why I spend such an inordinate amount of time figuring it all out. I know that every district has unique needs and a unique community, and therefore, I don't personally think that a leader comes in and says, hey, I'm here, I have all the answers, this is what we're gonna do. Instead, what's important to me is that we all connect on many different occasions. We talk about what's important to us in our community, our school district, our classrooms, our schools, whatever the case, and we collaboratively build a vision together that we move forward in the best interest of students. And so it's my hope that in the next 100 days, I don't know what the right number is, that we do have more opportunities to connect beyond just this one, and that we do get to know each other, because education is personal, and I want to make sure that you feel that you're personally connected, uh, hopefully as you always have been, but definitely as we go forward. So with that, Happy to have folks come to the microphones or give out note cards or I'll just keep telling you stuff, whatever. <laughs> Remember, I was a teacher, so I can talk for a good solid hour, <laughs> particularly if you want to talk about electron configurations and the periodic table, because those are some of my favorites. Um, oh, good. We have someone going to the microphone. Dr. Fagan, welcome to Kingwood High School on ISD. Um, I'm curious, coming from Iowa, Arizona, Colorado, what do you see is unique about the Texas education system? Differences that you've noticed here? Um, advantages, disadvantages to how we do education in Texas? So, um, one thing that I have uh, noticed is that education funding is ad inadequate everywhere, but uh, it, the degrees vary and um, in Texas, funding is better than in Iowa, in Arizona, and in Colorado, which I think does make a positive difference for students. Beyond that, um, Texas has a fair amount of local control opportunities that I value because I do think every different district is unique. And I've seen states where there's one large district with one certain set of needs, and so there's legislation passed or whatever the case, and that is then pushed into 200 districts. 200 districts that didn't need that exact legislation. They didn't need four REDAC tests per year even for proficient children. They didn't need some of those things. And so I, I don't, I'm not concerned that um, legislators are doing a really good job to try to help one district, but I think that one of the things that is really important to me and important in education in general is a local control sort of approach. And there are a lot of pieces uh, in Texas where the local district does have a say and the local district can make it somewhat their own. Uh, and I think that's a really important part of who I am as an educator and also a parent. Um, so I would just stress those couple of things about, uh, you know, generally speaking, the way that we bond and do buildings is pretty much the same. We're all underneath the federal legislation as far as testing and all that goes, but different states have taken different approaches. Uh, we've seen New Hampshire go really wide open and show a glimmer of hope for something better, and we've seen other states go in completely other directions, so there's a, there's a continuum there. But overall, I feel like um, Texas is a large state that has a, a good say. It's not a common core state, which is hooray for Liz, um, because I affectionately call the common, co common core the common floor, and just not a fan of it. Don't, I've done a worked with teachers, done an analysis of it, it's very low level, there's all kinds of issues there. So there are many things about the Texas education system that I think are very good, and there are other things that I think are still a work in progress, much like most states that I've been in. Do you want... And I, I needed to clarify prior to it. So, so in order to make the, our protocol, if we have a question, we're, we're not going to receive questions that pop out questions from the audience. So everybody can hear the question. So if you do have questions, please go to the microphone, uh, and we'll be more than uh, Dr. Fagan will be more than happy to answer every question that gets asked. Okay. Thank you, sir. I do have a couple of questions. Number one, uh, you're aware that 
a lot of folks in Kingwood commute in and out of Houston. And the reason that most of us, or a lot of us, live out here in Kingwood is specifically for the excellent schools. Uh, I guess my first question is this. Uh, Kingwood High School apparently has lost three very valuable English teachers over the summer. One was due to retirement. And Ms. Lori Novitz, who actually wrote a letter for my daughter, helped her get into Princeton University, she left over the summer. And also Mr. Fudo apparently has left, and he's going to the Woodlands. Are you aware uh, that these excellent teachers have left Kingwood High School, and do you have any reason why they left? So um, I am aware of that, and um, certainly that is a personnel matter that is pretty, um, in my opinion, something that I would not discuss individual teachers or their circumstances in front of an audience like this, but I, if you would like to reach out to us, I'm sure that we'd be happy to talk more about what we can share uh, with you specifically. Okay. And number two, uh, the second question, I guess, is uh, Dr. Uh, Reidlinger asked you a specific question about what is it specifically about Texas and Texas schools uh, that you like. Are, you are aware that Texas cut $5 billion in education, and that has not been made up yet. And what are you going to do to try to increase that funding so that uh, schools like Kingwood High School can get that funding back to maintain our excellence? And as you know, our property values in Kingwood are directly related to the excellence of the school district. So what are you gonna do specifically to try to get that funding back? So I think that um, across the country, uh, state funding for education has been dramatically reduced, particularly during the recession. And every state has worked back to, uh, to make some progress uh, the best way that they can. Um, it's my experience that together with other superintendents, with board members, with parents, with teachers, principals, all of us together, it's important that we participate in that legislative process and have those conversations in public about what kind of things we may lose if we don't have the funding that we need. And it's important that we continue to encourage within the, the dollar figure that they have uh, continuous progress in education funding, particularly when it's been reduced in the past. So I think that that's a common thing in every single state. And together, it's about making sure that we're all on the same page and we work together at the state level uh, to encourage our lawmakers, our state leaders, to prioritize education funding. That's the work that I've done in the past. That's the work that I think every superintendent does nearly every year going forward. That's just part of the education landscape today. And uh, we're always fighting for dollars, uh, particularly after the, the, you know, that huge recession that we all went through across the country. Hi, my name is Shelby Smith and I'm a student at KHS and I wanted to know if you're going to keep the same dress code um, rules that, <laughs> that we had had before and if you are going to change them, what should us as students know what we should expect for our dress code policies? Thank you for the question. Thank you for being here. Um, so I don't have any plans to change the dress code policy at this point. Um, I'm not familiar with a concern with it, but probably uh, we'll definitely hear more about that as we move forward. So no changes for now that I'm aware of. So there's a pretty large disparity in our district as far as some of the high schools and middle schools. Some of the things I read if, as far as the gradings, um, like Umbel was receiving F's and D's and some of the schools in Kingwood were mainly, mainly A's and B's. Have you had any experience in a district like that? And if so, or regardless if you have or not, what are the, some of the things you're wanting to implement to help bring some of those schools up and at the same time, you know, maintaining what's working right? Great. So um, almost every district I've, I've worked in, we've had schools that um, had, were higher performing and lower performing on various indicators, whether it's websites or whether it's a state assessment system. So one thing that I think is really important to me is 
that I don't think you necessarily really know a school until you're in a school and you visit with staff, students, parents. You, you sit in those classrooms and you see what's really going on and how, how everything, what's working, what could be better, what the staff wants to do better. My experience is that, again, it's really about customizing and personalizing the improvement, if you will, the continuous improvement to the needs of a community and a school. And to do that, I believe that someone like me has to spend time with folks in that school, not evaluating them, but instead helping them figure out what might be a path forward if they aren't satisfied with where they are as far as achievement goes or any other a number of things. And so um, it's my goal to get into every school this year, hopefully more than once. I never know, so I don't like to, I like to not overpromise until I really understand the lay of the land of my calendar. But I love to be in schools. I've spent every Thursday morning in schools unless I was otherwise um, sent somewhere else to do something important that I couldn't miss uh, in Douglas County. And that's where I learn what a school is really about. And that's where I learn what I can do to lend my professional expertise, my ideas, uh, sometimes resources, sometimes time, whatever it is, to the particular needs of that school. And that's what I hope to do here also. You know, everybody for 10 or 12 years across education has looked for a silver bullet. And the, and the reality is one just doesn't exist. There's no one program or one thing that turns something around. It's all about um, almost more like a medical approach where you really have to diagnose and understand the core you know, illness, if you will. A lot of times we treat the symptoms and then once you understand a school really well, you can sort of wrap your support, your time, your resources, your energy around helping that staff, helping that community move forward in the way that they really see as the solution. And you know, motivation, engagement, and buy-in are critical to change. And so all of those things have to be part of, of any system for moving forward. And that's, that's been my experience everywhere, is when you have schools that are, are challenged for a variety of reasons, you have to really know what's going on and then support that team of folks in doing what's great for those students. Because there's one thing I know for sure, is that I've never been in a school that just said, you know what, we don't care about these kids. It's just not, it's not what it's about. No, everyone cares about their students and everybody's doing the best they know how. So how can a leader support them in taking another step forward. And that's, that's what I'll work to do. Good evening. Um, my son attends Humble High School. And um, how does its Title I status fit within the district? and your vision that you see us going forward. Plus, um, how, do you address to, how do you plan to address the fact that the school is built to house way more students than it currently has enrollment? I know that Quest High School is moving into that, which will help um, keep the building full. But obviously, being an humble high school parent, um, it's hard for me to hear some of the comments that are made within our community about the wonderful students that, I mean, the wonderful students, well, my son, and his teachers. He's an A and B student, but yeah, he doesn't get the recognition within the community because, oh, he goes to Humble High School. You know, so how is you, are you, the superintendent, gonna help that community? So I don't, I don't want to be repetitive, but at the same time, I just have to reiterate a piece about, you know, I, 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 first of all, thank you, and I appreciate your passion for the situation. I can really hear in your voice that it means a lot to you, and, um, and that's an important part of our community and our education system. So, but the next step for me is to really get to know all the schools, including Humble High School, and really spend time there to, to understand. And then the other thing that a superintendent gets to do is spend time in the community and understand why people have a certain perception or why that kind of commentary is being made um, and then work to, to turn, that, turn that around for real, for sure, but also sometimes things um, that are being said are not quite right. Agreed. And so what can we do to, to repair and, and move that forward also? So there's, there's a PR aspect and then there's a real aspect of it. I don't know enough just standing here after two, day, two weeks and two days to give you the answer that, that would be the, the right answer. But I promise you that if we have this conversation again in a in few months, we'll be able to have a lot more specifics about what sort of things I've learned and where we can all go together. 
but is that something that the school board and you as the superintendent plan on looking at because the zoning for this community has been questionable in my opinion for the last 10 years you know from the inception of Atascacita High School and now going forward with high school number seven and its placement you know it just further helps to divide you know you say you've done research on this area that you wanted to be here in this area it seems like that would be something that would have been at the forefront because you can't miss it you really can't when you have a title one high school and it's the only one you have in the district and yes i know it's because of where people live and i know it's because of what people make and their income levels and so that's not something you or the board has control over but how we as a community deal with that is very important because the, the my son deserves the exact same education that the great and glorious kingwood high school gets and I think that, you know, going forward, that I want to see that, you know, the district has just as much commitment to those students as they do to every other one. And that's what I want to hear from you well, as a parent. Ask, if you're asking me if I'm personally committed to 100% of the schools, absolutely I am. What I'm trying to say, though, is, you know, it's, it's too early and too premature for me to sort of diagnose the situation and, and even you know, project some sort of a remedy. I haven't spent one day walking around the classrooms at Humble High School. I don't, I don't know what, what that feels like. I haven't had a chance to talk with students or staff or work with the principal or the assistant principals. I haven't had any of those opportunities. And so, sure, I can go and look at ACT data and I can go look at state testing data, but what I know is that that is one data point, maybe two data points, at one point in time, and there's a lot more information that is available to somebody in my position to really understand a school and to support it moving forward. But if you're asking me if it's okay with me that one high school doesn't feel uh, as supported or as celebrated as others, absolutely not. And I believe that that is the case for all the people uh, in the leadership team. I've spent a little bit of time with them, and it's my experience so far that everyone is committed and really working hard to make sure that it doesn't feel that way. But if it, if it does to you, we still need, we still have some work to do and, and absolutely accept that. Thank you. Hi, I'm gonna say welcome. Thank um, you. We are glad you were here. Um, so I have a Kingwood High School class of 2027 and 2029. Um, so I've got a long time still coming in this district. Um, and so given the way that this began, um, what is your plan for having solid communication with the board and solid communication with the parents um, as obviously changes come through the district? What's your plan for encouraging parental involvement and making sure that anything that's um, coming through is communicated clearly. Sure. Um, well, so the way that I would like to work with parents is, um, in general, I like to talk with parents. Uh, in authentic situations are the best, in my opinion. So these kind of situations are great. Also, offering parents opportunities to come together with me. Um, you know, we've, I've actually talked with some folks who said, you know, what about a monthly coffee or what about, I mean, those things are fine too. My experience in general about communication is that you have to use a lot of different formats, a lot of different strategies, because different people have different schedules. Some people like Twitter, some people like in person. And what I want to do is really understand what could be um, sort of a menu of strategies we could all employ that would make sense and make everyone feel like they can be connected if they want to. So that's kind of the, the road ahead for me is figuring all of that out. I don't have anything in place that I'm just going to launch out there. But the more conversations I have with people, uh, the more ideas I will get. And then once, you know, the way I work is I like to gather a lot of information and then it creates what I feel are sort of themes and theories for me, and then those are the things that I move forward and can say, you know, I didn't just come up with this one morning brushing my teeth. Instead, I went to three town halls and had six coffees and did these meetings. And across the board, I heard from parents that they would like to have these opportunities, these strategies for us to connect and communicate. And those are the kind of things then that I would want to at least pilot and then ultimately adopt the ones that are most successful. I have a question from the audience. Great. 
Uh, there is so much data out there uh, uh, proving the connection between success in the academic classrooms with success in the fine arts classroom. Can you tell us what steps uh, you plan to take to support the fine arts here in Humble ISD? So I have forever, every single year I've been in education, I'm a huge supporter of all the electives, all the fine arts, all the athletics. I worked with students all of my entire career and I've watched them love and thrive and learn just as much in the classroom as, or just as much on the field or at the, in the orchestra as they do in the classroom. The, the life lessons learned in electives, in fine arts, in athletics, all of those areas are really part of that idea of educating the whole child to be successful in their lifetimes. So I know that there was initially some sort of a rumor about, you know, that I don't like electives or fine arts or whatever, and I have no idea where that came from because I've never reduced them in my entire career. In fact, uh, in Douglas County, we had a real problem during the recession where um, class sizes had really grown, and the students were coming to me saying, you have to fix these class sizes. They are too large. It's not okay with us. And the schools were saying, we don't have any money. And so we had to come together in a time when the state of Colorado was reducing our funding and figuring out, we had to figure out how to preserve all the electives and reduce class size. It was like a, a, a whole list of completely impossible uh, scenarios. And what ultimately happened, which wasn't my favorite, but was really the only thing that seemed like it might work, was we asked high school teachers to teach six periods out of eight instead of five. And that added 100 sections to the, the calendar, brought all the class sizes to 30 or fewer in the high schools, and didn't remove a single elective or other offering. And so it was far from ideal, but when you're cutting 10, 11, 12 million dollars and your students are telling you classes are too large and they don't want to lose any electives, there's not very many options on the table. And so I've always worked to preserve the things that are so important to students. And I know uh, from being a teacher, from being a mom, from being a principal, that those are extraordinarily important to students and they prepare them for their lives. I want to say welcome. Um, a little nervous. I want to make sure I say things politically correct. So. Um, there's many different questions I can ask. My main thing is, we moved out here 14 years ago for a reason, just like some other people did. We care about our teachers. We care very hard, you know, that they, they're scared. If you talk to some people, and they're not allowed to speak right now. They're nervous, they, they're driving an hour to come here, and they're afraid that you're gonna come in and change everything. It might not happen in a year, but these are great teachers that have been working here for 13 years, five years, six years. So, I mean, we have to think because, as you know, on social media, there's a lot of negative stuff said about you. And I think that's why some of us are here is you need to defend yourself. So we come in and we think, okay, she's going to really help us. And I think as a person, I'm sure you're wonderful. But now you're coming in to represent our school district. Um, as he said, housing's going up. We want people to still come here to go to school, and not go to the Woodlands or go over here. So I think um, I would like to hear how you're going to you know, help the teachers that are traveling an hour to teach our kids that care. Does that make sense? Sure. Well, no, and I appreciate the question. Um, so there has been a lot of information flying around on social media. And um, you know, I'd, I'd rather not get into the what's true, what's not true, who said what and why and all of that, because I think that um, I've worked really hard for six years. Uh, to operate at what I, per what I perceive to be a, a very professional level of things. I feel like I've operated with grace and professionalism, respect. I don't feel like I've ever um, treated anybody uh, poorly or tried to discredit them. At the same time, you know, certain things that have been said are just simply not true. So one thing that I, I want to say, because um, I too want people to want to be here and nowhere else. And in Douglas County, I will tell you that last year property value increases on average were 17%. I can tell you that uh, my house was on the market for two days, had two showings and two offers. Um, I can tell you that there are a lot of homes close to some of our elementary schools that people bid on having never seen them and go through bidding wars. And it's nearly impossible when somebody is hired new into the district for them to buy a home very easily. And so 
Um, there's, there is a huge amount of building going on and yet everybody wants to move into Douglas County who has small children and so I too want that and I know there have been things said that home values went down or people don't want to be there and that's just simply not accurate if you look at the data it's very clear that that is not the case. Um, and beyond all of those things, um, you know, I have no, I know that I've actually had this conversation with people who have just come up and asked me and I appreciate that. You know, th I have no secret plan, I have no ideology, list of policies or laws or anything that I carry with me and can't wait to implement in a district. That's just not who I am. The, who I am is mother of Meredith and Olivia, high school science teacher, who remembers what it's like to choose between a vacuum cleaner and a microwave? Who I am is also the daughter of two educators. I also am uh, an assistant superintendent and superintendent who worked really hard to move the needle and do things for kids and to support excellent teachers and having a say in what happens in their classrooms. And I know that you don't get to hear from all of those people because that's generally not some of the folks that jump online and for a lot of reasons. But um, but I want you to know that, that as you get to know me as a person, as a leader, as a superintendent, I think you will see that um, I, don't, I don't have any interest in running out great teachers. That makes no sense. Um, I have no interest in doing anything as far as running around with a list of policies that I want to implement in every district. That's not me either, because I'm not a politician. I'm an educator. And I have worked for boards, and boards that have asked for pretty significant policy change things. And what superintendents do in general is this. The board says, look, we want to do X. And the superintendent says, well, let me give you some feedback on X. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? What about this? What about that? If you do this, this will happen. And at the end of the day, the board gets to decide on policy level decisions. And what the superintendent does at that point is she decides either she implements that policy in the very best interest of the students and staff of that district or the very best of her abilities and or she leaves. Those are her choices. And so there have been things that have been challenging in other communities. There have been things that not everybody agreed with. Absolutely. Clearly a lot of people agreed um, because there were elections that were one year after year after year in favor of some of those policies. But um, but what I want you to understand is my role here is to support great teachers and to support great principals and to support parents and making sure their children have what they need and to make sure we're financially sound and that we're proactively capitally planned, that our IT infrastructure continues to improve and that we're ready for the future and the tools that our students will need for their lives, uh, that we make sure that we have a voice in state and local policy decisions, uh, even federal ones if we can. And those are all things that I have done consistently over time and will plan to do. And in my head, when I do those things, will be all of you and all of the students and all of the staff and all of their voices and all of their thoughts and feelings as I go forward and say, the Umbel ISD community is against X and here is Y and this is why we're fighting against it. And, and that's what I have done. And so, you know, I, I do appreciate the question, I really do. And, um, and I appreciate all of you because you've been kind and open-minded and um, wanting facts, and I love that. And um, so just, so that's kind of where that is. And I'm happy to, um, if you have something that's really on your mind specifically and you wanna talk to me, I'm sure we can figure that out too. Um, but I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hello. Um, I have not read any of the social media stuff, so I have no <laughs> idea what people are talking about. Um, I'm a parent and also a soon-to-be teacher and middle school here. And um, my son is, he just finished third grade. And last year, at the beginning of the year, his amazing teacher suggested that he might have a possible learning disability. And so we filled out um, some paperwork and wanted to get the process started. That was in September at Open House. They tested him in April. They finally got to him in April. And so he spent this entire school year, um, you know, third grade becomes harder. And that's when he started to realize this year that school was difficult for him. 
um, that he wasn't as good as the other students, that he had a problem with writing and he had some struggles and he never knew this and his confidence went down. I feel like that could have been prevented if this, if he was identified or tested and, and addressed earlier. Um, we were told the reason is because there were only two people in the whole district that can address his needs uh, or even do the testing. So I guess two specialists in his area. Are you aware of this gap? And what is your experience working with um, teachers, parents, students um, of that community, the students with disabilities? So I, I'm, I'm not aware of that particular situation. I thank you for sharing something so personal. Um, so I look forward to understanding it more and looking into it. Congratulations on your position. And, um, and so I have always, whether it was in the classroom or as a building principal, in fact, when I was at Mormon Trail High School, there was su such a small school. This is one of the best things that I think ever happened to me. It was such a small school that if somebody said curriculum department, that was me. At risk department, that was me. Finance department, me. Special education, me. So I did every single thing. Our superintendent was shared and part-time in our district. There was an elementary principal in the other building. She was another town. And the moral of the story is that as a result of that, I worked with um, our special education teachers and really got to understand how that all comes together with IEP teams and documentation and providing unique and supportive services for children who need them. So I'm sorry to hear the timeline that you experienced. I look forward to understanding that better and uh, providing whatever support that I can so that we can make sure that we're timely with uh, meeting the needs of, of students. Um, the questions I have don't surround um, the social media. Um, I've done some investigating and found that you've been on a, on a lot of uh, panels that are on reform, uh, like the Friedman Foundation. You've been a speaker for, for them, not, not even attending them, but being a speaker. Uh, American Enterprise Institute, um, the Thomas Fordham, and you were on a panel for education system reform. And in Colorado, you implemented a lot of things that had to do with choice and vouchers and reform. And that's, that's sweeping the nation. And now it's absolutely sweeping Texas. And the board has said that they don't plan on doing that. But there's also not just vouchers, but there's like tax credits and things like that. And there's, you, had, you were embroiled in, boiled in some lawsuits uh, that had to do with implementing those things in Colorado. And so I think people are a little bit nervous that you're going to do that here. It's not just the social media. These, the, I, I mean, I can, I can tell you some things that, that and, and you agree that you've been on these panels and all of them are on reform. And are you gonna continue speaking on those and take time away from, from our district? So I'll, can I am I can I answer? <laughs> so um, so as far as Friedman goes, you're right. They are um, they're interested in educational choice. Douglas County had the first charter school in Colorado in 1993. Um, that was a long time ago, and that community has embraced the idea of educational choice for a long time. And so the Friedman Foundation did contact me more than once and said, "Would you be willing to just come and share the Douglas County story on what they've done, why they've done it?" I said yes. And that's what I did, was shared the information regarding the specific things uh, that that district had embraced. Humble ISD is a completely different district. Uh, Tucson was a completely different district. Des Moines was a completely different district that had no charter schools ever. Uh, I believe they might have one today, long after I was gone. But the, the idea here is that every community and school district is different. And Douglas County embraced choice. And so that was part of my role and position uh, to do the work around choice and to share that information. And you're absolutely right. The Board of Education had a choice task force in 2009-10. That task force had seven subcommittees. One was home education, one was vouchers, one was charter schools, one was level playing field. I can't, now, I can't remember them all, but uh, at the end of the day, they came forward with recommendations to the board. The board accepted those recommendations, directed the staff to fold them into the strategic plan, which we did. Uh, we implement, we actually went and visited the Colorado Department of Education in January of 2011, uh, asked them if it would be even possible for us to go down this pathway of what we were calling a scholarship program, uh, where students would have to get into, well, first of all, we'd have private schools that would be our partners, they would meet all of our thresholds for quality, and then a student would have to apply on their own merits, get in, and then the district would 
uh, much like a Pell Grant, uh, give them a scholarship that they could then take to a school that was on that list. The Colorado Department of Education said yes, even helped us uh, design it, which was a little surprising to us, but that's what they said. And shortly after, the ACLU sued the district uh, over the program, and so there, there definitely was a lawsuit. Uh, in Douglas County, though, all of the money to pay for the lawsuit was privately raised and was not, uh, did not come out of the district coffers, which I think is an important part of that conversation. As far as the American Enterprise Institute, I believe the panel I was on, I was the anti-Common Core person, and then David Coleman sat next to me, and he was the pro-Common Core, pro uh, you know, uh, his stuff that he's working on guy. So that wasn't really on, on choice per se, that was really on the idea of curriculum. And I don't recall the Fordham Foundation, but sometimes they work with the uh, Friedman Foundation, so it's very possible that uh, they also had some sort of an event where I shared the Douglas County story. But the other answer to your question is, so that was an expectation to participate and share that information with others. Uh, in, in that district and in that environment. Omble is completely different than that. And so no, those would not be things I would be interested in, in doing because we're not doing them. And, um, and so there would be nothing, nothing to tell, if you will, and not really, we wouldn't really be part of that conversation. So those are the, the pieces of that, I think. So are you saying that you will not be doing like extracurricular activities, if you want to call it that, on... Um those particular uh, foundations, um, like educational choice, 21st century education, um, ed choice, ed leader 21, you were very prominent with ed leader 21. Ed leader 21 has nothing to do with choice at all. Ed leader 21 is about creating, uh, ensuring that all districts that are members of that organization are uh, educating their students with the outcomes that they need to be successful. Ed leader 21 is very committed to making sure that um, there is collaboration, critical thinking, uh, creativity, and one more C that I'm forgetting, creativity, communication, critical thinking, communication. Um, and that's, that's the work that they really do, and it's a professional learning community of superintendents, so don't misunderstand. I didn't say I was not going to participate or support any group in the nation working on anything we're working on. That doesn't really make sense because you can get a lot of economy of scale when you work together and education is, um, is something that you partner with other districts on. What I was saying is that when I was in Des Moines or Tucson, these other places that weren't as uh, embracing of the concept of, of student or school choice, um, I was not working on that topic. But when I went to Douglas County and that was very much uh, a cornerstone of that district, uh, that was part of my work, and that's what, that's what I did there. Uh, just simply shared uh, what had happened in Douglas County and the Douglas County story. Well, I'm, I'm a bit confused. I'm on the understanding that you wanted to, uh, uh, that, that you did what the board told you to do. But it's my understanding that you implemented programs that you created yourself on world-class outcomes guaranteed and viable curriculum, 21st century skills, and deeper learning outcomes. And what about the site program that's continuous improvement for teacher effectiveness? Are you going to be implementing any of those? So world-class outcomes, the, the first part of what you're talking about, when I came to Douglas County, the district did not have a curriculum. And it was the expectation that we work together to build a curriculum. So we bought, brought hundreds of teachers together in multiple disciplines and grade levels to build outcomes for students, and they're aligned to the Colorado state standards, so it wouldn't really make any sense to use those here, because this is obviously not a match for that. Uh, the other thing you mentioned is SITE, Continuous Improvement for Teacher Effectiveness, was the evaluation tool that teachers in Douglas County started developing in January of 2009. I didn't arrive till July of 2010. In May of 2010, the state of Colorado wanted to become a race to the top state. So they adopted the Common Core and they started going down the path of PARC and they also required the teacher in principal accountability pieces of Senate Bill 191, which said that every district in Colorado would adopt a new teacher evaluation instrument, a little bit like Texas recently did, only Colorado came out with their instrument. Uh, it was 31 pages of cumulative rubrics. Our teachers and leaders in Douglas County said, this is crazy, we could never do this. Every teacher every year, 31 pages of cumulative rubrics. One of the options in the state of Colorado is for districts to build their own instrument that crosswalks to the state instrument. 
So again, we brought together hundreds of people to build unique rubrics for the jobs they do every day and ended up with 26 or 27 different rubrics, one for music teachers, one for PE teachers, one for uh, what we call general or core teachers, one for counselors, one for nurses, I could go on and on, but they built their own that all crosswalk to the state instrument. And so that's what site is. Uh, it's required by law in the state of Colorado, and again, it's crosswalk to the state instrument in that state. Well, the thing about Texas is um, we, are, we have to become a district of innovation, and we're about to become that. And there's a lot of us that are very nervous uh, because it's going to open the door to vouchers. Um, and I'd like to know if that's the, the you and the board, if that's the plan you plan on making, doing. No, I'll tell you the story on the district of innovation piece. Guy contacted me, I think it was the end of May or the 1st of June, and he said, listen, we, um, we've always run a calendar with early releases and late starts in it, and we've always applied for these waivers to do that because it's required by the state, and the state denied our waiver request and said that the only way we can follow the calendar that we have followed for, I don't know if it's 10 years or something like that, is if we apply for this district of innovation status. It's sort of a hoop we have to jump through. It's not timely at all, but they've told us this is what we have to do or we have to give up this calendar. And so I thought, well, that's really bad timing, but he felt that it was just an absolute need to move forward with. And so he said he was going to um, communicate it out to everyone. I was copied on some of those emails and let everybody know what had occurred put together the committees that are required by law to get the status and ask the board to approve it. There's been zero conversation about District of Innovation being used for anything beyond what's specifically stated in the plan. That's all it is. It's an opportunity for us to continue with a calendar that we've long used and want to continue to use as a district. Um, um, there's a few other components in there, but they're Again, the same kind of thing. It's all posted online. There's Q and A's, and and it is what it is. It's as transparent as it can be. And I can promise you, I've been involved in no conversations. I mean, zero, to broaden it out or make it something else. Hello, uh, welcome again to the district. District um, follow-up question to that. So, came spent the last ten years in Clear Lake, moved up here to Kingwood a year ago. So my Stay with my wife, my kids are 27, 29 uh, class, and this was the first year they had early release, and I know the middle school and high school has late arrival. As a double, I guess I'm trying to understand the, what's the reasoning behind that? You may not be the right person, for, what, what, what's the reasoning behind that? Because I know it's like, if, if you have two working parents, I have to imagine getting a kid to middle school with nine is difficult, but make it 10 or 11, that's gotta be even harder. And then the early releases, there seems like our kids are, out of school more often than they're in school because every other week there's an early release day. So how do, why do we have early release and late arrival and what's the benefit of that? Why do I get, why are my kids being out of school for these days? So I'm really gonna be answering this in a speculative position because I haven't had these conversations in depth about what actually happens on those days, but I will tell you in most districts that I'm aware of, uh, that's planning and collaboration time with teachers. Teachers have not nearly enough time to work together and there's tons of research and data out there that show when teachers have more time to work together and plan then the experience that students have is actually better and so I know it is a challenge there's no question about that and I've had that conversation many times over the years um, one that we need to probably continue to have but there's real value in in having that quality time if it enhances all the rest of the time and so we have to balance that out and it's it's not perfect there's no question about that but in general, my observation of it is that it is really valuable and quality and important uh, for the continuous improvement of the classroom experience for students. Thank Thanks. I know we've got another patron coming. I'm going to ask a couple questions, if you don't mind. These are questions that have been submitted by audience members. So our first one was, uh, when Atascita High School opened in 2006, students who actually live closer to Humble High School were redistributed to Atascita. Are you aware that many residents believe that the lines were gerrymandered and that Quest High School was moved into Humble High School to justify building another high school? Is there currently a lawsuit regarding this situation? Not that I'm aware of. I haven't heard about a lawsuit about that, but I also probably haven't read every single lawsuit that might be available. I'm not sure about that. Okay, I have a, a, an additional question. How do you plan 
excuse me, how do you plan on regularly communicating with teachers and keeping those lines of communication open? Well, so first of all, I, um, I answer all my own emails. Um, nobody does that for me. And I'm happy to connect with teachers however they want. And so we do have teacher advisories here that I plan to continue. And in addition to that, like I said, I like to be in schools a lot. And my, you know, and it's an interesting dynamic because I like to just come to schools and visit because I want to know what it really feels like. You know, I don't, I don't want the special sign or the marching band or any of that stuff. I just want to know what's it like on a normal day. What's it look like, feel like, smell like? You know, what's it? You know, I'm good with all that. You know, I love that. I've seen it before, and so. Um, and so I like to talk with teachers when I'm in schools. Not all teachers are super excited to see the superintendent in their classroom. Um, <laughs> nothing like parent-teacher conferences, though. Um, so anyway, what I try to do is really get a sense of the level of comfort of the teacher, because I don't want to, you know, somebody who's already not very comfortable with me in their room, I don't want to hang out and, you know, be bothersome or whatever. I mean, I just want to see what it's like for kids. Um, but people who want to visit with me, I love that, and so I plan to sort of issue that invitation when I get a chance to talk with all the teachers and leaders in the, in the district and say, you know, please, when I'm in your school, if, if you want to talk with me, do, you know, walk up, pull me aside, whatever works for you. Um, if you don't like that, email me. I mean, there's so many different ways that people have reached out and connected with me over time, and I embrace them all. And I try to be fast, but depending on what's going on in the day, um, sometimes I'm faster than others. But those are some of the things I want to do and continue to do. I think the advisory is a really good start. We actually did one of those meetings when I was still in Colorado, and we did it virtually, which is a little more challenging. But at least we got to know each other at a high level uh, early on, and I'm glad, I was glad for that. And I have one more, then I'll turn the floor back over to the audience. It says, will you be in attendance when the Texas legislature starts uh, debates regarding new requirements for our district? And who else from our district will be representing Umbel ISD? Uh, that's a really specific question um, <laughs> that I haven't had the chance to really uh, get that all organized yet. So, but we'll definitely talk more. Whoever, whoever asked that, you know, you could email me and then I'll know who to uh, connect with when that all comes about. The way I like to work with the legislature is I can't just run down there and be Liz with one opinion. I have to be, you know, Liz from Umbel ISD with, you know, a few hundred thousand opinions uh, kind of behind the scenes there. And so we have to come together and know what are, what are our priorities? What do we want to fight for? What are we interested in? What do we want to see come around and be better? And those are the things that then I gather up the team of people who are superstars in those categories and who feel comfortable testifying and going and talking with legislators and having coffee and doing all of that stuff that you've got to do. You know, I remember when we were working in Colorado and it was with the full support of the community and the board, we were fighting the testing stuff. It had gotten way out of control in that state. And, you know, when we were getting down to the final minutes of that bill, it was midnight and we're all on the phone and we're, you know, Senator Holbert's calling and saying, now what about this? Is it okay if we just keep ninth grade? And what about, you know, that's the way it works. And so you have to engage in that process as it exists and really work hard to move the needle. Sometimes all you get the first year, which is what we got the first year, was a committee. But the second year, we got real change for our students, for our parents, for our community. So it's possible. I know it's possible. And I know it's only an every other year meeting thing. So you've got to make greater progress in a shorter amount of time. But, um, but I think that's uh, the context, and everybody knows it here, which probably helps because in Colorado, they go, well, we'll just talk about that next year. Um, so anyway, I don't know any of the details about that yet, but we'll definitely uh, be in touch. If you have more specific questions, just email me. Good evening, Dr. Fagan. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. It's nice to meet you tonight. Um, my name is Ashley Gibson. I'm a teacher at Summer Creek High School. This will be my fourth year in the district. Um, we've had a really long run with our previous superintendent, uh, Dr. Sconzo. So we're used to, you know, a pretty personal feel. And I was just wondering about your relationships with teachers and how you envision yourself building closer relationships. More specifically, I guess this is kind of a piggyback off the previous question, but um, more specifically, what do you value in your relationships with teachers? So. The, the real answer to this is I want as close a relationship as people want to have with me because um, I realize my role is not exactly that and, and I've had a few principals over time let me know that too. Um, but so I have, I have my responsibilities and I have to, you know, prioritize those of course. But, you know, I have the other side of me though, the part of me that kind of keeps the fire burning is that whole notion of instructional leadership. I love that stuff. And I have actually partnered with teachers uh, in Douglas County, one-to-one. -one. We've 
collaboratively develop units together over Google Docs, because we can't always get together geographically separated, but you can do a Google Doc together, and I can be typing stuff, and you'd be deleting my stuff, and that's okay, <laughs> you know. I don't take it personally, I just, I like that stuff. I like to work together on instructional things, and the other thing that I do that, in my opinion, has sort of kept that candle burning for me is that I like to teach professional development. Now, I haven't gone down that path here because my, my plate is so full, but, um, but eventually that's something that I really enjoy doing. And um, depending on the needs, because, you know, I have certain expertise um, and not others, and I wouldn't, you know, I probably wouldn't be the best person to do certain things. But, um, but where it's appropriate, I really do enjoy doing that. And so I've done that um, in Douglas County. I teach a lot of different courses. Uh, both online ones because it's difficult when you have thousands of teachers to reach everyone and so to make it available to more people we've done online versions we've done in-person versions we've worked together develop units together I remember I took Olivia when she was tiny uh, on a Saturday to Castleview High School to meet with the social studies department because they were building curriculum and so I was the the person assigned to that group and I really value those things and building authentic relationships that are based on what we have in common as professionals. So, I was thinking also more specifically, what did those advisories look like with teachers? So what do they look like now? Yes. Somebody else want to answer that? <laughs> Go ahead and answer it. <laughs> Whichever you like. I, yeah. Because I've only had one experience, but we have an expert in the room, so. Uh, my name is Louis Mascola. I'm on the Kingwood High School. Uh, I'm their rep on the Teacher Advisory Committee. And we did meet uh, on video conference and uh, really appreciated getting all the answers, especially with all everything that we had heard and, and wanted to hear from you personally. Uh, we meet monthly uh, at a pre-assigned time. We know uh, we assign the, the agenda, basically. Uh, the superintendent will come up with a, things to share, uh, positives in our district. All, uh, all the secondary schools meet in one day and all the elementary uh, schools meet on the other day. Anyway, we do have a, uh, a, a chance to uh, provide questions in advance. Uh, the different cabinet members or the superintendent the, herself will answer those questions based on teacher uh, needs uh, or concerns. And we really do appreciate you, uh, the willingness to continue that work, and uh, hopefully that it'll make a positive uh, impact, at least on communication, if not on the, uh, the effect of education in our district. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for doing that. Is that information on these committees, is that like public information about what's discussed and the questions that are asked and the answers? Is that is that something that's provided online somehow or like as parents like I would be curious of what was happening or is that something y'all keep among I mean I don't know I've never heard of these before <laughs> so I'm curious I can I can speak to what we get is a, a minutes of what was discussed and the answers for each of the questions that were presented and we usually just share that out with the teachers because it's a teacher advisory committee and uh, some of that information, um, we don't go through the legal process of is this pertinent to be able to share out because it may, I don't think it's ever had any specific names involved or anything like that. It's usually pretty, pretty broad subjects, um, but uh, like dress code came up and a few others and uh, I think testing has always been a, an issue and, and those type of things and how to implement change on your campus. Right. It's, not a, it's not an open meeting, but at the same time, and you know, certainly want to continue to encourage teachers to bring their real thoughts and their real ideas and their real questions. And I felt like it was very authentic and everybody was very real and very, very valuable group that we have. Okay, I have another question from the audience. Um, what are some incentives that could be offered to keep teachers uh, in, in classrooms to give stability to schools and students? Well, the best people to tell us what incentives might be valuable to them would be the teachers. And so it would be my experience that that's something that could go on that agenda and, and have that conversation and say, 
you know, do you like the idea? Do you not like that idea? Do you, if, if that was going to be a good idea, what would be some things that teachers would enjoy and allow the teachers on the advisory a chance to go back and talk with their colleagues and then come back and bring that back. So that's the way I like to work. And um, so I don't have, I mean, I, I don't think it's, I don't know, that's, it wouldn't be my thing to be like, oh, well, I think all teachers want these things. Um, I mean, I certainly remember being a teacher, but I'd like to talk with people real time and find out what would make a difference for them. Hi, um, I'm a student. I just finished eighth grade at Creekwood Middle School. And over that year, I spent countless hours sitting in a desk taking star tests, mock stars, and district benchmarks. So my question is, what are, are you going to plan to do anything different to like maybe not have as many? And what can I expect as a student in the future for this? Thanks for the question and for the, yeah. It seems like there might be some support for your ideas. <laughs> Which helps me out, by the way, because uh, you know I, I, I need to understand what is our collective position on uh, assessment in that way so that I can then go and advocate from my position as superintendent for the, the change we'd like to see. You know, I, I have to be honest, as a parent, I, I'm not excited about excessive amounts of testing, and I think that it's gone too far. I, I'm all for us knowing kids are learning, demonstrating that kids are learning, making sure all kids are learning, making sure that we're giving feedback to parents and the community. I'm all for those things. But I'm not for measuring what's easy to measure just to have more data about stuff that we don't need. So that's one of my happy topics. But <laughs> I have to know that we can all be together on that. You know how that is, right? It's not always a popular position at the legislature, but I don't mind that. OK. <laughs> Just take it down. There you go. Um, what is your opinion on the role of direct instruction in a classroom? Because some people believe there shouldn't be any, some people believe there should be a lot, some people believe there should be a mix, and I'm just curious what your personal views are there. Well, I think it depends. Um, it depends on a lot of things. So if some students really benefit from direct instruction on certain topics. That's the best way for them to learn that particular piece of knowledge or skill. On the other hand, I have seen um, an overuse of direct instruction and some students not be engaged or motivated to participate and then there'll be a lot of challenges with that. So um, I don't, I'm not all for any one instructional strategy all the time. I'm not completely against any instructional strategy, I don't think. Um, at, at the end of the day, what I like to see is um, a teacher who knows their students well, who knows the targets that their students need to learn, who crafts a path from point A to point B with those students, generates engagement, has a warm culture and climate, has appropriate amounts of accountability, and, and differentiates as necessary, and then checks in to see how we're doing and makes modifications as we go. So does that mean I like project-based learning? Sometimes. Do I like direct instruction? Sometimes. Do I like, you know, what I don't think is fruitful is you know, memorization, regurgitation of textbooks, I think we're past that in education in general. Hi, Dr. Fagan. Hello. Um, I had a question about teachers. Uh, there have been quite a few of the community members, whether it be on Facebook or uh, whether it be in the school board meetings, who have talked about teachers being you know, very nervous, very upset, very scared. Um, I wondered what feedback you have received about teacher concerns since you've been here and how you plan to address their concerns. So uh, we mentioned that we met uh, with the teacher advisory groups and I felt like they were very candid in asking all the questions that they had and I answered them. Um, I have not actually heard any concerns since that time that I can think of. Um, I mean, I've, heard for, I've talked with some parents who have said that teachers have concerns, but I haven't heard from any teachers or principals about that. Um, and when parents have brought it forward and said, you know, I'm, I'm doing this for a teacher, 
you know, I've given an honest answer that I hope goes back to that teacher, that they understand that I don't have a secret agenda. I'm not here to, you know, fire a bunch of teachers. I've never done that. I, can't, I haven't fired a teacher in six years, uh, probably longer. Uh, that's just not my role. I'm here to support great teachers. That's the work that I do. I support great leaders. Um, I am a barometer of what's fair and right. That's my responsibility and my role, you know, the quality assurance sort of officer of the district. So if I see something that's not right, not fair, you know, it's my responsibility to work with folks and try to come to that win-win position that we all aspire for um, and, and not just look the other direction. That's probably not part of my DNA. Um, but I want all people to be successful, and I love people enough to tell them the truth, but I do it in the right way. Um, and I want people to grow and improve and feel excited about what they're doing and be inspired by what they're doing. And I want people to have a say, because that's what I like to have. So that's my answer to that. Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, so my name's Emily Humble. I'm a student at Cape Park. Uh, we've met before. I'm also an intern for the Tribune newspaper. And uh, I have a question kind of I touched on when I've talked with you before. But I'm really interested in uh, how, uh, as a superintendent, uh, students are going to be able to have their voices heard directly to the administration. Because, you know, we had the student here earlier talking about star testing, and that is a real concern with students. We've had, you know, a student talk about dress code. That's another, you know, real concern students have. And, you know, people laugh, and maybe it's a little silly to talk about, but students are really passionate about dress code, I can tell you that. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> like, I'm just curious, you know, in what ways can students make their voices heard so they can have change in their district? Because this is their school district. This is, you know, what they're, they have to do for like 12 years of their lives, you know. What can they do to tell the administration what they want to change and what they like and what they don't like? Great, thank you. Well, um, so my answer to that varies. If it's a district level policy, I would encourage students to come to me. I've always had a student advisory group the last six years, worked directly with students from all the high schools in the district. They would bring things forward. In fact, they're working on a policy right now about receiving physical education credit for some of their athletics, et cetera. Um, and not credit, but kind of a, a waiver system. Anyway, the idea is that if students are interested in policy level changes that are at the district level, then I encourage them to work directly with me. That makes perfect sense. Um, I've, sometimes I like to, to Liz to the rescue a little bit. And so in the past, you know, I may have been quick to answer or support a student. And some of my, my loving principals have come to me and said, now really that was for me to solve. And so I really do try to um, encourage students who have a building level concern uh, to work with the folks in the building together to resolve that and not be uh, superintendent to the rescue because you know people like to have the opportunity uh, to, to meet the needs of the students in their classroom or their building, whatever the case may be. So that's, that's kind of what I would encourage students to do and we'll just have to decide how we want that to look, whether it's a student advisory group, um, we, we do a student Twitter thing. They do a student Twitter thing. I promise I'm changing my vocabulary. Old habits die hard. But, um, and so there's a lot of different strategies that we can work together with students on, and i um, interested in those. Uh, just to clarify, earlier you'd, we, I'd asked you about the three teachers who were leaving uh, Kingwood High School, the English department, which is quite a blow to the English department in Kingwood <laughs> High School. You did not mean to imply that any of those teachers are, have left for disciplinary reasons, have you? No, I just implied that, or I was just trying to say that, um, right. Generally, my personal policy, professional policy, is not to talk about individual people in right. front of groups. And there, you've obviously heard a number of questions uh, about concerns about our teachers, um, uh, because you know, if our teachers aren't happy, our students aren't going to be happy, and we're not going to be happy, and I guarantee you our school board's not going to be happy. So I, I want to ask you this, though. When, when the lady was up here asking a number of questions about specific organizations, a number of those specific organizations, to a varying degree, have a very anti-public school agenda. And you've admitted to some involvement in, in those organizations. Can you understand how the teachers within this school district, knowing your political involvement in those kinds of organizations, would be concerned about you coming on board and what you might be trying to effectuate as our uh, administrator for the schools? And what are you willing to do to assure those teachers that you're not going to be uh, an ideological uh, person with an agenda that's going to hurt education in this district? 
So um, I guess I, I would just respectfully disagree with the comment that those are anti-public education groups. Um, I have spent not very much time with them, but a little bit of time with them on different occasions, and I've never heard any of the people uh, who run those organizations or who are speaking on behalf of those organizations ever say that they were anti-public education. And, you know, I am the daughter of a public educator. I am a public educator. My children go to public schools. Um, clearly, I am very invested in public education and believe in the power of public education uh, as, as sort of a cornerstone of all that our country has done and, in my opinion, will do. And so um, those are really important values that I hold, and I would never and have never uh, participated with or been part of any kind of anti-public education group, rhetoric, anything. That's just simply not true, and uh, I certainly have no interest in doing that going forward either. Um, so going back to the District of Innovation, um, I know that uh, it has uncapped class sizes for K through 4, effectively. Um, I know our board has said, trust us, we'll keep the sizes down to 22, but um, with, there's no guarantee that board will exist going forward after, you know, we have elections and things. Um, what is your opinion on... Uh, good class sizes for elementary, middle, and high school? And um, is there any way you can assure us that the lower levels of kids especially are going to stay at smaller class sizes? Well, it's my understanding that the district has a longstanding commitment to having uh, uh, 22 students in the, in the primary grades and that there's no interest in changing that whatsoever. Now, it's, I've also seen that as, as we go up in, in grades, that it creeps up to that, that 30 number. And, you know, frankly, to be really honest, if, if we had unlimited resources in education, I just, I think 30 is too big. I don't like it. But I understand that we have to keep things in balance with uh, the whole picture and the cost of, of adding um, additional teachers, which is ideal, but sometimes not real. And so uh, it would be my goal to continue to work with our principals uh, on class size to the extent we're able within the finances that we have because I, I personally am a fan of low class size. I will tell you that uh, class size is a de local decision school by school in my previous district. And so when we were looking for the right school for our daughters, we had a school pretty close to our home, but the community really valued electives in elementary, so they had eight electives. The trade-off for that in their budget was really big class sizes, in my opinion. And another school that was much further away, but still a neighborhood school in the district, uh, had a value of low class size and four electives. And that's the school that my husband and I picked because that's what we wanted for our children. And so I'm supportive of lower class sizes, but I'm also open-minded enough to understand the dynamics of the finances and education uh, in our country right now and practically every state uh, in the Union. And if you look at, there was really interesting um, maps done not long ago where they, they marked the average uh, per pupil funding in the country and then they showed the, the places that are 30% higher than that, 30% lower than that. You could just see the whole country was either green if they had lots of money or red if they had a very low money. And you can look across the country and it's, there's just a lot of red. There's a lot of red and we have to continue to work to have the resources we need so we can provide low class sizes and electives. We shouldn't have to make a decision between those things. Um, I just wanted to say that um, there's been some voices here tonight that have been speaking for the way teachers feel. Um, I've been in the district, my husband and I have been teaching the district for 36 years. And although change always gives us a little anxiety, I'd, I'd like to voice that there are many of us out there that are looking forward to moving forward with you as our leader, although you have some very big shoes to fill. Thank you. I would like to welcome you to the district, Dr. Fagan. And Thank I you. want to address the gentleman over there. Um, I know we did lose. I've been teaching at Kingwood for 18 years, about to start my 19th year. 
We've lost some great teachers, but our leadership team here at KHS hires the best English teachers, the best social studies teachers, the best math teachers. And I will say, you can look around at that department and be proud of who's still there. Um, I've coached in this district and the lady I coached with for 16 years, her daughters are like my sisters. They both went off to college. They wrote um, essays in college. Those professors said, where did you go to high school? This is one of the best written papers I've ever seen. So you're, you have nothing to worry about there, sir, because there's other teachers here who are just as good. <clears throat> Sorry. Like Guy says, this is family. So I kind of felt like that was an attack on us. So I'm just defending my family. Um, my, next, my next point. I, uh, okay. Well, it felt like an attack. So I just. Um, my next question is, um, in the state of Texas, over the last, I guess, eight years, they've started eliminating the credits uh, or doing away with the amount of credits needed for physical education and health. Um, which are two subjects that, because I coach, are very dear to me. Um, <laughs> when you were in uh, Arizona and in uh, Colorado, um, did the number or number of credits or the requirements go down, and did you fight against it? Because I know you're an ex-tennis coach, um, because of the importance it has. Um, I feel like kids nowadays, they get that middle school health. I think every single freshman needs health their first year because of the topics that are addressed and talked about. I think um, you hear things in seventh grade, but it doesn't really hit home because things change in high school. We all know that. <laughs> and I think it's uh, important that the legislatures, and we talked about adding new classes, that's what made me think of this, is are you gonna push for that? That it comes back as a state requirement or even a district requirement or up the number of PE credits um, because I have a three and an eight year old and I'm sick of my eight year old going, can I have your iPad daddy? No, we need to go outside. And, and, and I'm doing my best as a parent to promote that. But it feels like the legislature has said, well, that's not important anymore. And my question is, do you feel like it should be pushed back to a year and a half for high school students and a half a credit of health? So, um, no, it's, it's, totally, it's totally fine. Um, so I hesitate to just go, yeah, because um, I, I don't, I, there's so much information behind a situation like that. So I'd really like to understand the history and the context of where have we been, where are we now, why are we there, and what are our options for going forward, where do we want to go forward, and then how, then how can we all work together to get there. And so um, I, I believe as a, just a person, a science teacher, parent, that physical education is important and that a lot of students really, really benefit from that opportunity. Um, and I also think that there's variability. I worked with that group of students in Douglas County who said, you know, I go to two hours of practice and this and that and the other. I go run cross country. You know, what about that? So I think that there's, I'm open to the conversation and want to uh, work with everyone in figuring out what our right pathway forward is. I just am not familiar enough with the current state uh, okay. to understand what's been lost and why it's been lost. Okay. I very shortly and then I'll walk away. Uh, <laughs> they eliminated the health credit I think four years ago and added more career tech because uh, everything's going So technology. the state did that? Yes, yes ma'am. And then okay. the, the districts could keep it as a local credit. We chose not to and that, that's their decision. That's fine. Um, for the PE credits, their justification, the state in, the state came in and we have to do the fitness gram for all athletes in the state of Texas. Well, yeah, those numbers are going to be very high because we're testing the athletes. So the state's like, oh, we're fit. We don't need PE. We know. We can sit around at the mall. I love to people watch. You can look around and realize we're not a fit society and we need more PE, more physical education, especially for our younger kids when the type 2 diabetes is being recognized and diagnosed in second and third grade. So that's it. I'm with you on that. I'm going to have a, the next question. I also want to do a time check, and, and this is the hard part for me as the moderator because it, it will get to a point where I'll have, to, I'll have to say last question. And the beauty of, of I think, the dialogue we, that we've seen here tonight, this will not be the last time we'll have the opportunity to visit with Dr. Fagan, whether it's a town hall meeting or in, in the grocery store. So the bottom line is we have a time check at 7.33. We'll go up to 7.50.
Uh, we'll take the last question at 750. Again, I apologize if that offends anybody, but that's the ground rules that kind of that we've laid out. We've got two additional meetings that will be coming. Uh, and so I have a question that uh, was submitted. I want to make sure that this gets uh, asked also. There have been rumors of a market-based competitive pay scale being implemented in Colorado. It seems that this has, has and would be a big part in teacher morale and retention going down. Can you assure us about the, the uh, different situations and assure us that this would not be implemented here in Umbel ISD? So again, you have to know the, the, the context of the situation. So. Walked into Douglas County, two years of pay freeze, inherited, and then we went on into the recession, two more years of pay freeze. Teachers were hired in on top of each other because that's what happens on a salary schedule. If I'm a first year teacher, I get four years of pay freeze. You come in, you're a fourth year teacher, in the fourth year you get to go to year, step four, I'm still stuck on step one. That's unfair, creates inequity in the system, and yet we didn't have the $18 million to remedy it. So that, the other thing that we were dealing with was Douglas County is one of the lowest funded districts in the state of Colorado. That's just the way the funding formula works there. The same sort of factor system is in place here, um, probably not to that same degree though. And so as a result, and Douglas County being in co competition with the Denver metro area, we had inequities in our system because of the pay freezes. And then in addition to that, we were not able to hire people into really hard to fill positions with our current system. We weren't able to get the special education teachers we needed, the Chinese teachers we needed, the AP Calc BC teachers we needed. We had a real issue in our district. So again, an impossible set of facts. So we came together and we had always had easy to fill and hard to fill two different categories, easy to fill, hard to fill. But it wasn't very transparent. It was kind of like, well, you go into HR and you kind of go, well, I'm hard to fill, and they work it out. And so we had this, in, this entirely horrible set of circumstances, no money to go with it, and we were encouraged to uh, create a system to improve our ability to hire, attract, retain, uh, change, fix the inequities, um, and do all of those things I mentioned. And so instead of having just easy to fill and hard to fill, because we couldn't afford to do a big, huge division between those two, we created differentiated bands according to supply and demand in the marketplace. So the, the lower the supply, for instance, school nurses, we would advertise for three school nurses, we would get two applications. Special education teachers, we would advertise for special education teachers, we would get a handful, maybe, of applications. And so some of our students had some of the greatest challenges in the district. We were not able to attract the best of the best of the teachers for them, and it was not okay. So we created more differentiation in the pay so that we could afford to pay the harder to fill or the low supply a little bit more. And although not a popular thing, for sure, uh, it did meet the needs of the students in the district because two years into that system, Don Bell, who had been the special ed director for quite some time, he actually retired two years ago, said in front of the board, he said, this is the first year in Douglas County, we've had more quality special education teachers apply than we need. And we can now put a quality teacher in every classroom. And we're still meeting the needs of all the other students. And the other thing we did was, we didn't just do that, but we continually worked to move all of them up. And every year brought everybody up to a higher level walked in our pay for starting teachers. We had some teachers in the, the $35,000, $7,000 mark. And now everybody's 40 or above several years later despite the pay situation we had to deal with. And so that is not something that you take and you just implant in a system. It was unique to the needs of that district and those circumstances and those students. It was a solution custom built for there. It is not something that you would take and just say, hey, here's what we're gonna do. It doesn't make sense to do that. And that's why I've said over and over and over again that you know, every one of these scenarios where people have sort of you know, had these, these things, um, that's a different school district. You know, Tucson Unified School District force buses kids because they have to. It's a, they're under a federal desegregation order. I'm not gonna force bus kids here. I mean, it's the same situation, right? You have to, you have to work within the space and the context that you're in. And, um, and that's the situation with, with what the market-based pay or what that means is supply and demand drove if you were in a hard-to-fill category or an easier-to-fill category. 
Okay, so my question came up when you were talking about the DOI and the class sizes and how that's now going to be completely uncapped if that plan does pass. Even though it's not intended to be uncapped, it is in writing uncapped. Um, so you mentioned that um, you, were, you had the opportunity to choose a different school for your kids to go to because the school they were zoned to wanted um, the larger class size and the electives. And you're very focused on what a group wants. But what a group wants isn't always what's best for every one of those kids. And while we do have in-district transfers, there's a list of specific reasons you can mark to do an in-district transfer. So my concern would come into play of now that we have these uncapped things, my son's school decides, you know, we really want more arts and we want more of this. And so we're going to raise our class sizes up. Um, and every, you know, since the majority wants it, that's what we're going to do. And now I'm stuck with my autistic child sitting in a room of 35 to 40 kids because that's what the group wanted. Well, I, I guess I, I hear what you're saying and I understand that that's a scenario that you could create, but, but the reality is I haven't met um, a principal here or a teacher here, anybody who's interested in that, um, letting class sizes go way up. That was never part of the conversation on District of Innovation. It was really about just maintaining what we have done here for a very long time and not changing anything. And there would have been no District of Innovation plan were it not for TEA's decision to reject the waivers that we had asked for and requested for years. So the, again, I, I know that this is one of those things, but I'm just telling you that that's the fact. Dr. Sconzo put, uh, put this out because he had to, to maintain the, the schedule and the options that we've done for a long time, but there's no interest in that. I they, certainly would not be interested in supporting they ha that. They haven't rejected any class size waivers, though. They only rejected the um, early release and late arrival. Right. So I just, I just want to make sure that, you know, there's a lot of oversight there if, if we start to go in that direction because that's scary for people that do have kids in situations where they wouldn't be with the majority. Absolutely. Well, it's so. scary for me, too. And, you know, and again, the context of Douglas County is there's a lot of open enrollment, and that's the way it is, and the context here is very different. Hi, my name is Scott Ford. Uh, <laughs> we know each other on Twitter, at least. Twitter, yeah. And uh, really quick, uh, the coach over there. I hear you, I teach career tech, and I've taught PE. And so I both love what I teach and hate what I teach at the same time. But I am happy to see all these people walking around with their technology trying to catch Pokemon. So that's kind of a, <laughs> that's kind of a nice compromise there. Um, <laughs> I've been an educator for over 16 years. And I've worked for a, a Spring Branch IS, or a Springwoods ISD, private school, Humble ISD. I then went off and worked for the FBI, CIA, and all this other stuff. And I want to preface this comment before by saying the best person I ever in my entire life worked for was Bodie Wagner, who was the Kate Center principal who just retired recently. This man was phenomenal. And so when you're an educator, and especially when you're a nationally known educator like yourself, and you know I've got a little bit of a following too, uh, you hear horror stories. And this is not specifically about this district. But you hear horror stories from teachers where there will be a turnover rate of 20, 25, 30, 40 percent. And those are considered normal numbers. And the principal is just continuing on with their destruction. I would love to see Humble ISD take a, uh, an innovative approach on evaluations where teachers have 360 degree evaluations. In classrooms, you have teachers with 15, 20 plus years, master's degrees, doctorate degrees, who are masters of education. And it would be nice if teachers could also evaluate their principals and administration to the point where if an administrator, let's say, got 50% or more unsatisfactory ratings from their own staff, they were either gotten rid of or put back in minors to go work with somebody who is highly recognized. For example, Bodie Wagner, who was just an amazing principal. And so I know this is kind of out of the blue, but I would love to get your thoughts on teachers also evaluating administrators, kind of a 360 degree evaluation. So there are a lot of districts in the country that do three, administrators, leaders do 360s. Generally though, they're not um, high stakes, as you described. Uh, generally, they are used for goal setting and professional growth and development opportunities. 
uh, so that people feel very comfortable with the whole process. Um, so, you know, I think that it's good to have a lot of feedback, and I think it's also challenging for people to have a lot of feedback, but if, if, if I and those that work with me are doing a really good job, we're providing, hopefully, teachers are giving us quality information, and hopefully we're providing quality feedback and coaching to those leaders. And so they do have a sense of their strengths and their challenges, and they're continually progressing and growing and getting better. That's the way it should be for everybody. And so I have to kind of pause on the, if you get 50%, you're out kind of thing. Um, and, and I'd have to think about that a lot. Uh, it, it feels very, um, I think fear is not necessarily the healthiest culture. And so what we want to create is a healthy culture that supports continuous improvement, maximizing people's strengths, working with them on their challenges, a growth mindset for everyone because that's what we want to model because that's what we want to see for our students as well. So I, I, like I said, I'd have to think about that more. I hear what you're saying. Um, I think that principals in general do want feedback from staff and, and I think a lot of principals know very well um, their own challenges and how they're perceived and the things that they're working on. Um, I know my high school teachers were always quick to tell me stuff and, and, I, and I like that, you know, I'm, I'm, come on in, shut the door, tell me what you think, that works for me. So. Oh, just in general. Thanks. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you a question on what you, what the future of Umbel ISD would be for you. Like, what do you want to do over the next four years? Like, what would you want to change, or what don't you want to change, and how would it affect me as a student? So. Um, I don't have anything that I want to change because I don't know enough to have anything that I would want to change. Um, really, what I'm concentrating on is really the first 100 days, maybe, maybe the first year of what I mentioned earlier, really spending time and talking with students like you, talking with teachers, talking with leaders about, you know, what are the things you think are, are really going well that you would never want to lose. That's really valuable information for me. And other things that you don't think are going very well, she mentioned star testing and the amount of time and all of those pieces. That's really important information for me also because if you talk with 100 students and every one of them or a good number of them mentions the same thing, that's something that I really need to pay attention to. Um, not that the other things aren't important, they are, but there are certain things that really rise up as the, the highest priority. You can just feel it. So I don't have a list of things to change. And I think that most of the things that, that students experience as change are generally done at the building level, not at the district level. Although sometimes the state hands us down things that we have to do, and then those, are, those have impacts on students. Um, so I can't promise that there won't be anything that the state hands down, but as far as right now goes, there is no plan uh, to improve change or anything. Right now there's really a plan to get to know, to understand deeply, to seek to understand all of those pieces. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello again. Um, so earlier you spoke a little bit about um, how you would like to get to know the parents before deciding how to build connections between us and a community. Um, you mentioned also that there is a teacher advisory council that is collected together already and that you'd be open to a student advisory council and that's something that happened in Colorado. So my question is, um, would you be in support of the district um, forming a parental advisory council? So as, I'm definitely open to it. As soon as I understand the lay of the land as far as all of the ways that we connect with parents through PTAs, PTOs, all of that kind of stuff, booster clubs, um, as soon as I understand the lay of the land, I'll be, I'll be better equipped to answer that question, but I'm certainly not opposed to the idea. I just want to make sure that we build an appropriate infrastructure that makes sense and, and includes everyone. Um, that's really important to me, that people feel like, you know, everybody's included and, and is welcome to participate in some way. So, yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and I have two more questions, and I'm not sure if there's anybody else that's trying to come back up to the mic. And so... Um, I'm going to ask these two questions, and I believe that when Dr. Fagan has the time to respond to them, there'll, there'll not be time for any further questions, um, but we'll monitor that based on, based on the time. Um, 
And so the first question uh, I, that is, that's come out is that I agree uh, wholeheartedly with the PE coach by saying that I am a special ed para, and I hope to hear and see that the district continues to incorporate the integrated athletics program for all special needs students uh, to participate in an active, motivated program to promote exercise uh, into their everyday life for, uh, that would allow, um, excuse me, that for their lives don't always allow them to move and to be healthy. Would you continue are you going to continue integrated athletics? So um, my answer to that is I'm a huge fan. I'll go ahead and step out on that limb without additional information um, because I am a big fan of that. I think it's hugely beneficial to students who participate. So um, I can't see any reason why we wouldn't continue it. Okay. Very good. Next question. Um, with all of the things going on in our country uh, regarding police violence and, and uh, race relations, how do you suggest this issue uh, be addressed with our students in the school setting? Wow, oh, that's a really hard question. Um, so, you know, I think that there are probably teachers who are watching that unfold and contemplating that, um, you know, as, as, they, as they think about, particularly teachers who have naturally connected content uh, to those topics are probably thinking about how they might um, encourage respectful dialogue around resolving conflict and, um, you know, a lot of those bigger picture life lessons. One of the things that I've seen teachers do that I think is really powerful for students is connect something happening today to some other historical event, maybe even in a different country at a different time, and really provide an opportunity for that analysis um, and understand uh, the, the, gr the bigger picture, and, you know, we all have the cliche, you know, if those who fail to study history repeat itself, all that. Um, but it's true, and if, if and when students are given an opportunity to really analyze and evaluate current events against past events, they, they really thrive in that experience, and it's instructive for them going forward because then they start to do it on their own and they start to see things differently. Uh, instead of having that sort of blinder on to just see today, uh, they start to see the world as a big connected place, one that they can learn from and, uh, and not repeat mistakes of the past, and maybe even have really great ideas that we've never thought of uh, for making things better. Uh, the kind of students that, that I hope that a school district like ours can produce are the kind, I don't know if you saw the 60 Minutes, uh, piece on Duke University and the, the, the guy who took the polio virus and he modified the DNA of the polio virus. And um, so I, I, this really connects with me because I taught microbiology, right? And so you probably remember it, you know, mitochondria and, you know, Golgi bodies and all that. So I taught microbiology. I remember that unit. I remember what I taught. Well, I'm pretty sure I didn't teach my kids to take it this far. So, looking back, I, I may have shortchanged him a bit. So this researcher at Duke University, he took the polio virus and he modified its DNA so it could not replicate. So it's unable to reproduce, which is really cool. But then he took the polio virus and he injected it into a brain tumor of a 20-something-year-old nurse who had the most aggressive form of brain cancer where it doubles in size like every week or something like that. It was just it was a terrible story. And what happened is the, the body's immune system, the nurse's immune system, recognized the polio virus as polio and went in and destroyed the tumor. And today, she's still alive, and the only evidence that she ever had brain cancer is a surgical scar. So back to my original thing. You know, there are a lot of really important, authentic problems in the world that our students are capable of taking what we're teaching them and thinking about it completely differently than we ever have. And that is what I hope a, a school district like ours can, can encourage and inspire in students' individual areas of passions. Because as I think back to my microbiology unit, when I was teaching them to do smears and gram staining, memorizing the parts of the cell, you know, I never thought about it that way. I wish I had. I wish I had because I've seen students come alive right now, today, doing that level of work because they can, and I'm sure, I'm certain, there are social studies teachers, probably language arts and English teachers out there, thinking about 
how they'll give students a chance to learn from the past and apply it to the present and make sense of their world and come up with great ideas for maybe ways to make it better. So. And I, I hate to do this, and, but I'm more than happy. I'll personally take your question and I'll, I'll get it written down because here's, here's what I do want to do because I know there are others that probably might want to ask a question too. And so I, I appreciate you. I know you made eye contact with me. You gave me that please look and <laughs> I, golly, I, you know that, but that's why I'm here. So, you know, I, I take my role seriously and, and I do appreciate the fact that you had a question and, and I know that there's going to be more questions, but I do think it's, it's fair. First of all, there needs to be a, a, a slide that'll go up that'll show some additional information moving forward. But I do think it's fair to doc, Dr. Fagan to, to, to have uh, you know, the last one or two minutes in comments and prior to that, then I'll close us with additional information. So if there's anything, in Dr. Fagan, that you feel like that you did not be, you weren't able to speak on or you would like to speak on, please take that opportunity to do that now. Well, I just, I really want to sincerely thank you all for two hours of, of your time, for your courage to get up and ask hard questions, to really put it out there, um, what you're thinking and wondering about, giving me an opportunity to tell you the truth from my own heart so that you can hear it from me because I think that that's one of the most important things is that we are connected and that we do have communication face to face and uh, email and social media. Uh, whatever works for you works for me. I, I really, that's important to me. I told you I'm from a small town in Southern Iowa, 2,500 people. No kid ever skipped school because Mary Murphy was a manager at the convenience store and she would call your mother the minute she saw your car. So that's, that's kind of the, that's, that's my roots. And, um, and I, I like to know people and I like to feel connected to people. And so I appreciate that you took the time to come. Uh, it means a lot to me. And I hope that we continue to have this level of conversation and collaboration. I know that together we can do great things. Um, that's, that's what I'm most excited about, is working together with all of you. Um, so please, if you didn't get your question answered, it's very important to you, please just email me and I will answer it. I promise I will. I answer all my own email. Um, if you all email me, it will take longer, but, <laughs> but I promise you that I will answer. So, uh, with that, I want to say thank you again, and please uh, feel free and welcome to come to the other town hall meetings if you'd like, and otherwise, I look forward to seeing you again, whether it's in the classroom, in the school, at a football game, or whatever the case may be. Thank you. So as we, uh, we close tonight, I, I do again want to thank all of you uh, as our community members being here. I know there's a lot of faculty and staff. I, I, I recognize uh, folks that are here. I want to thank Kingwood High School there. Frank, your team, Theater, Rusty, your folks. Uh, thank you all so much. Our district people for putting this together. Dr. Landry and your team, uh, Ms. Drabing, Kingwood Park. Prior to, prior to coming in at 530 today, the, some of the student council representatives from Kingwood High School and Kingwood Park greeted Dr. Fagan with a little, little meeting earlier and gave her a gift, gift basket, and so we're appreciative of that. Um, again, uh, we look forward to uh, many more opportunities to visit. Thank you guys so much for coming out tonight, being cordial, cooperating. Have a great evening. Thank you very much.